So, if you guys are ready, we're going to jump into our content. Uh, the first category that we're going to get some video content on and then answer some questions about is marriage. So here is a, uh, so a clip, a video clip really from a podcast that Pastor John and his wife Lynn did in the past. I mean, I, I think about when we met mm -hmm. and we kind of went through this thing where you lived in... Um, Springfield Massachusetts. Springfield, Massachusetts. I lived down here in northwest Florida. Right. We wrote letters. We made phone calls. We wrote then, letters every day. Right. I remember that every day because there was no cell phones back no, then. There was no and there cell was phone. long distance phone calls. And we made a long distance phone call after hours on 1130 on a Saturday night. So we finally got married. Uh -huh. We got engaged. We got married. And you did leave your world. I did. You left West Springfield, Massachusetts. And I came down to. Pensacola, Florida. Yeah. I thought I had kind of made a mistake. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the, the, yes, I. <laughs> it was hard at first because no. after I can remember, after about six months after being married, I thought, "Oh my gosh, I can't go home." Right. And that was a little scary to me at first. Yeah. Like, wow. I, th I think you know, talking about marriage, the one thing that I, I wanted to to try and bring into the discussion was that a committed marriage that lasts a lifetime is a great picture of the commitment that God makes to us and we make to him. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a shadow of that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't compare to the great commitment he's made, but it certainly is an amazing shadow and mirror of what yeah. God desires people to see in a relationship with him. And so I think when, when marriages fail, when they don't uh, live up to their commitments, in one way it's breaking a testimony and something that God wants the world to see that has to do with his character. That's why it's probably so under attack. Yeah, today. I think so. So like Pastor Joe mentioned, you guys were faithful to share with us uh, numerous questions. And so we have a couple of a couple of pages of content in front of us that center around four topics, and one of those topics is the topic of marriage. And so uh, tonight you're going to see clips from things that we've produced in here and other places. The first two will come from a podcast that my parents put together a few years ago. But in this topic of marriage, um, you know, there's a lot of questions that were asked about roles, even about rhythms. Like one of the questions that we were given is, how do husbands and wives incorporate their natural and spiritual giftings in marriage? Here's the one thing that I love about Cece probably more than anything else. She is nothing like me. <laughs> I love that because I know me, and too much of me is too much of me. Does that make sense? And so I'm a very, probably you would say, structured individual. Yeah, I would say that. Um, and you're a very easygoing individual. And together in our marriage, that first kind of developed a little bit of, I don't know if the word is combative tension, but tension would nonetheless. Those first couple that you said, and oh my gosh, six months, I can't go home. <laughs> like we had to learn that. And I would say, you know, we've been married 17 years, so we're a little bit younger, you know, inexperienced, you know, compared to panelists. But um, we have learned, I'd say in the last five years, how to really lean into those giftings in, in more of a collaborative tension. Does that make sense? And I think collaborative tension is the way things get done. Strength happens with collaborative tension. Um, impact happens with that. So let me share one way that we have introduced natural or spiritual gifts in marriage. Administration, you could say, is a gift that I would have. Maybe some of the staff members on the team would say, yep, that's him. Well, years ago, I developed kind of a rhythm for team members in our church of how to just stay ordered with your schedule, with the questions you have to ask, how to assess if something's being effective or not, how to communicate in visual, oral, and written forms, V-O-W, which I think is one of the most effective ways to communicate. And we call that little tool SAPS. And here's the funny thing. We both share an account with AT&T. We have a cell phone plan. We both use iPhones. 
they have an app on here called Notes. So we use SAPs in our notes to keep ourselves organized and communicating. Because here's the deal. I sometimes would assume something that she, she'll do, and she'll sometimes assume something that I'll do, and it would constantly bring tension between us. And so I said, you know, this works really well in my life and with our team. What do you think if we tried it uh, in our world? And she said, absolutely not. You're not going to structure me. And I said, well, okay. Uh, yeah, somebody claps that. Yeah, that's my sister. Yeah, I said, okay, well. Uh, so years later, I'll let you speak to it now. Okay, yeah, I struggled with uh, being organized. I was a little afraid of it. I felt like I was constricted if I was writing down a plan, like I had to stick to it. Um, but I've learned that plans are written in sand. And so that saps just writing each other notes. And you can, it'll have a pop-up that comes up like, you know, CC has edited you know, notes. And so I can see when he edits something or I edit something. So he can see like as I'm checking something off or if there's something I need to share about our family or kid or something like that that uh, goes in there that we can read and check off and stuff like that. So that's been just in the last, probably, what would you say, within the last year, we've really started using that. Um, and that's been really effective um, for us to stay on the same page because we both get busy doing stuff. So. Right. And I just say one last thing before the others kind of share. That was just one question I thought I could answer is, but Cece also, like, is a very loving, gracious, kind, high level of pain tolerance person. And so I think someone who's a little bit maybe too, I think the word sometimes has been called anal. I think that has been said before. Um, yeah, yeah, about me. Yeah. yeah, no, maybe not. Okay, we won't talk about that. Um, but, you know, structured, we'll put it that way. Ordered, you know, value, efficiency, whatever. That can be a little intense if we're both like that. And so I, I love that Cece sometimes goes, hey, I didn't do it. I didn't, it's like, Hey, I need to sometimes maybe not sweat the small stuff. Does that make sense? Like, as kids grow through seasons, I don't want to miss things so focused on what's supposed to happen at this age and this stage, and we should be here, and just miss the moment. And so being partnered with my partner gives me this wonderful counterbalance. And it's interesting, when we first were married, we saw those as like, how did we get married? You know, like that kind of question. We're so different from each other. Over time, through commitment, you go, thank God. We're so different from each other because I, I need this, and I hope that she needs this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's just one thing that a natural spiritual is kind of like goulash. Does that make sense? Like you're not a four-course meal. Like, well, here's my body. Here's my soul. Here's my spirit. It all goes together. Those spiritual gifts, those natural giftings, they're in marriage. And that's how it incorporates into our lives. But, I mean, there's my mom's got pink, blue, yellow notes here, so I know she's got a lot of stuff to share too. But that was one of the things about marriage that I thought, you know what, that's probably something we could answer. But... Mom, dad, Nate, Allison, whatever you think. We're nothing like that. <laughs> <clears throat> I, uh, I don't know what SAPS is at all. I don't know what that means. Is that an acronym, Neil? Okay. Whatever you want. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I, think, I think probably the biggest thing for us is in this kind of regard of natural and spiritual gifts, like how do you incorporate both? I think for me it was a big switch to know that she's my helpmate. My wife's my helpmate. And that she's not um, coming against me or judging me or critiquing me. Uh, she actually is my helpmate. So her natural spiritual gifting is to actually lift me up and to support me. When I had that little mental switch, I was like, oh, yeah, she's not just raining on my parade, she actually wants the best for me, and she's using her gifts in, in that way. Like, she's a great communicator. I'm not a good communicator, so uh, she'll, you know, she'll help me do that better. You know, have you, have, you, have you responded to this text message? Hey, have you called this person back? Oh, yeah, I haven't. She's not bugging me. She's actually making me better, so that's a little something. Yes, we don't know what SAP is. I just wanted to speak for a minute how Pastor John was talking about our testimony of our marriage. Um, and I think that Nate and I, we've been married for 20 years, and a lot of our friends have been married for a while. And I think we've watched the enemy attack the testimony of our friends' marriages. And that's something the Lord has revealed to me more and more as my kids have gotten older, the importance of allowing our marriage to be a beautiful testimony and legacy to our kids, from the youngest of young to the oldest of old, because God has 
a beautiful way of using our marriages to teach them kindness and patience and love and joy and all of that. And so it's God's design for marriage is to um, beautifully impact all of the generations that are watching. And Nate and I were in youth ministry for years, um, and I just remember always asking married couples to come and pour into the youth and be a visible testimony of marriage for these youth so that they could see godly marriages in their lives. So just to encourage you guys that your marriage is a testimony in your home, in the church, in the community, um, how you treat your wives and how you treat your husbands um, is all a, re a reflection of the Lord. Good. Good. Pastor Help John. me right there. Thank you. Pastor John Lynn, maybe you guys could pick one of the questions in that. And please don't use the word anal. <laughs> Whatever you do. <laughs> well, okay, here, here's one I think that all, all couples probably deal with. How can we better communicate in our marriage? So you assume some things sometimes. I don't know if you've ever done that in a marriage. And learning how to talk to one another and communicate to one another is, well, it's a learning process. One of the things Lynn and I knew when we first got married was that we both, well, we were both mission majors in a Bible college, so we knew that we wanted to be in ministry. Uh, the pathway there was difficult, uh, but it was interesting. And, and I, I grew up here. She moved here from Massachusetts. I knew everybody. She knew nobody. My phone's ringing all the time. Hey, you want to go surfing? You want to do this? And Len's phone's, well, it's not ringing. And uh, so we had to communicate about expectations and time. And uh, one of the things we did at the very beginning was my wife loves to walk. And so we would walk. And she would talk. And I would listen. And I would ask her, I remember this at the beginning of our marriage, I said, Lynn, I want you to tell me, and I'm not going to respond. What bugs you about me this week? <laughs> <laughs> and she would, she would tell me. And I would listen, and I would try not to get defensive. And I would try to say, okay, you know, we're, we're young, we're married, we're trying to figure each other out. But I think one thing that helps you communicate in marriage is to pray together. Mm. You hear each other's heart. And I'll say this about that. It's the one thing that the enemy will fight you on all through your marriage. I don't know why it's so hard to pray with your wife, but I would have to say it's one of the most difficult things to get into a rhythm with. And I think it's because the enemy doesn't want you to. And he'll fight it and fight it. But communication is so important, and, and you have to do it. You have to do it all the time. And you have to clear the air. You have to make sure you're on the same page and make sure you, you communicate about everything. The kids, the money, the, the house, the, the friends, the, the schedule. I mean, Lynn's always got the calendar out. So what's going on? You know, and, she's, and, I'm, and I'm not as organized as she is. I, I, I think that we, we complement one another in that. But I have found out that the key to communication is every day, all the time, on every subject, and to be open to issues in your life that need to change. Your, your spouse has been put there by, by the Lord, and they are the most strongest instrument that he's going to use to shape and fashion you into the person he wants you to be because nobody else is in your life that close and knows who you really are. And so God will take that chisel and he will use it through communication and you learn how to do it in a way that is not destructive to one another, but is constructive. And so Lynn's gonna pick it up from here. Well, I really don't know what else to say about that is, um, you know, we had a perfect marriage. We just didn't have a lot of conflict. Bull loney. I mean, <laughs> I'm a very strong, you know, I have a strong uh, personality, but, you know, learning, <laughs> just learning about this thing called submission, what, what was that all about? Because scripture talks a lot about that and realizing that someone, I mean, I think you're mutually submissive in your relationship in marriage. Sometimes it's in biblical arenas, it gets perverted and it just looks like it's lording over, but just learning how to 
function together um, and become leading and cleaving and what all that looked like for the first couple of years. And um, as we started raising our children in the midst of um, starting this church, I, I had some pretty strong guidelines for my children. I wanted John to be present in the home and but not, I was not, I don't consider myself a nag, but when I become a nag, I say, you make me a nag because you don't do what I want you to do. So, yeah, right. so you know, so we had to work that out. Um, but, you know, I think in a marriage, uh, ladies, and we, you need to really work on your own personal walk with the Lord and not expect him to be your savior, your leader. I mean, they are your leader. They are your covering. But, um Work on your own relation with it because the Lord will help you with forgiveness and expectations. For the first 10 years, I thought John was the enemy. I really did. And then I realized there is a battle that goes on in your marriage. And it's a spiritual battle because just like Allison said, you know, it's the one thing that the world's looking at. Are they going to make it? Are they actually happy? Do they enjoy it? And I'd have to say... Um, in marriage, a lot of times, and I would say to John, well, sometimes when you speak to me from your lips to my ears, I'm hearing something completely different. Um, so we have to clear up communication because you can go for a, two or three days without talking just because you're mad or you're angry or you're, you're feeling misunderstood and all of that. But um, cultivating laughter in our marriage has been really, really good. John's very good at that. When we were dating, we laughed a lot. And I think that's important in marriage and to remember, remember why we were even drawn to each other. Because one of the saddest things I think about a marriage that doesn't work is, golly, they used to be so crazy about each other. What happened? And I think go back to some of those things and remind yourselves of some of those things that attracted you to that person. I'll, I'll, I'll just... Yeah, you're way too long. Uh, <laughs> one, one more thing that... that it's a, significant to us we had a song in our wedding called let us climb the hill together it was an old jesus movement song and uh when i think about our relationship and all how long we've been together and our kids and all the, the starting a church and all of that it's been like climbing a hill together and you start off we started off with nothing and you know then you have uh, a child you build a house you you have two cars now instead of just one, and, and, and life begins. And you, and you look back, you get, get here on, on the hill, and you look down and go, wow, this happened, this happened, this happened. Then you get here, and you, you look down and go, wow, this happened, this happened, this happened. And you get here, and you look down and go, oh, wow, look, now we have 14 grandkids, and this is going on, and la da 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 And I say all that to say this. That's about all you've got is that together looking down that hill and going, wow. Now, we're almost over the hill, no. but we're not, we're not there yet. But what you, what you really have is in, in life with your spouse is you look down that hill together and you go, wow, look what God has done. Look how faithful he's been. And if you, if you break apart or divorce and, and someone else helicopters in to where you are on that hill, they look down with you and you know what? They don't see anything. But together... You see this amazing hand of God in your life, and it's a wonderful thing to do. Not everything's perfect, but you, one thing we have found out is that God is so faithful if you trust him and continue to follow him and communicate together properly and never lose your sense of humor. It, it, it breaks a lot of ice. Yeah. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next topic is parenting. And again, we're going to go to a podcast uh, that Pastor John and Lynn did. This, this passage of scripture, this thing of a heritage from the Lord. Certainly he's the one who gives us the children, but we together, based on his word and the, you know, the leading of his Holy Spirit, with the Lord, we build that legacy. We build that heritage. It's a, it's a reward from him when we do. And it's like arrows in, in, in our hand right. that we say, okay, the number one priority is not so much that they become a doctor, lawyer, or Indian chief, mm -hmm. or that they go to the best college in the world. Um, the number one thing is that they learn that Jesus Christ is real. They can have a personal relationship with it. It's kind of like that verse, 
Seek ye first the mm-hmm. kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added. If we can get them there right. and know it's real, um, man, you've hit the target. One of the illustrations I've heard about this, this arrow thing is, you know, you take the arrow, you point it towards the target, uh-huh. and you start off, you know, you pull an arrow back yeah. inch by inch. And the further you pull it back, the, the, the more shakier it gets. <laughs> <laughs> the quivering. Well, the, the, the more tension is in the yeah. bow, and and it's kind of like Richard when your Richard. kids are at the final stage of about to be released. Yeah. That's when it's the hardest. Right. When they're teens or young adults, and man, you, you sometimes you just want to shoot it in the air or in the ground yeah. or just get rid of them. Sure. But you have wow. to realize that your goal with that child, with that young adult now. With all you've invested in them is like, yes. you know what? Don't blow it now. You're almost to release the thing. Let it hit the target right. the best you possibly can with the Lord's help. That's good. Anything you want to follow up on that? It's our blessing. Yes. Every child's different. Mm-hmm. And um, raising children and being married is the two most difficult things you'll ever do. How many agree with that? I can do it, all that other stuff every day of the week, but those not only are the most important things in your life, but also the most difficult things. And there's a, there's a lot of, of questions that came about children, and there, there, there's, uh, you know, tons of them. Like, um, here, here's a simple one. How to agree on raising children especially in gray areas the Bible does not directly address, such as, here's one, celebrating Halloween. So we had three kids. We grew up in the, this culture, and there's Halloween. Um, and, and in their early stages, and this is just, this was our preference, we didn't really celebrate Halloween when our kids were real little. We'd go to putt-putt. We'd do all kinds of different stuff. We'd take them to movies, and we, we just weren't big into Halloween. Now, as they got older... There was a lot of peer pressure that came about Halloween, but we didn't go the monster ghoul. It, it kind of like I don't know if you know who Chuck Smith is. He started Calvary Chapels. He had a radio program, and he was very anti-Halloween, very anti-Halloween. And so I remember he had a call in from a young child one time and said, "It's probably a kid who was probably about eight or nine. Mm-hmm. And Chuck's answering phone calls from people all around the country, and this little kid goes, "Pastor Chuck." So I know you don't believe in Halloween. He goes, but I don't want to dress up like a ghost or a monster or anything like that, Pastor Chuck. He goes, all I really want to do, Pastor Chuck, is get some candy. (laughs) He says, Pastor Chuck, do you think that's okay? (laughs) So there's this long pause. Because everybody knew how anti-Halloween Chuck was. And finally you hear Chuck go, you go get yourself some candy. (laughs) So we, we made it about the candy, and, and we let our kids go. Hallow- and, and Lynn, as we got grandkids now, they go through our neighborhood, and, and I stay home and pass out the candy, and then they come back and dump it all in the middle of our house, and they, they're, like, they're like gypsies trading all this <laughs> candy. It, it's mountains of it. But, you know, I, I think you know, that's something that, that is not going to send your kids to hell to celebrate Halloween. But I think it's a parent's choice. You have to make choices based on what you feel is right for your kids. And that has to do with a lot of different things in life. Uh, you want to talk any about that? Um, just, you know, Halloween for sure. Just I just make things that somewhat are questionable, make them, they can be fun without you having to be so um, strict and stuff. I just think if you, if you communicate to them, and we know the origins of certain things, um, Share, your, share those beliefs with your kids, but keep it fun um, and stay away from those evil, uh, evil expressions of it. But another thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was um, just um, screen time with the kids. You know, I didn't have to grow up in that. I thank the Lord. Neil had a flip phone, and he drove the kids to school, and he, I said, call me when you get there, and, you know, call me when you, you, when you get to ready to leave. So it was really more of a just a, a safety thing. And so I, my heart goes out to parents in this culture because it's crazy. Not only does God have a plan for your children, but so does the enemy. And this tool that he's using is a cesspool of things that are just being poured into 
uh, their lives. So I just think that um, to be admonished to myself and all of us, that the, the screens are not babysitters. Don't use them as babysitters. Um, and to, as parents, just be intentional about scheduling times that they have on it. Obviously, you know this, and monitoring it. And, and when you have family times, don't be, have it be around a screen. And maybe have it around an activity that you're actually doing. The things I also felt, feel like that our kids picked up at home is that we were the same people at church um, as we were at home. So the things that we practiced, um, you, you know, we were just honest. We were just real. That we we didn't we weren't fake. We didn't you know quote a lot of scriptures and always sing in psalms and spiritual songs. We were real people that you know just lived it out. And so that when our kids grew up, that they would see that Christianity is an authentic way to do life. And so, I don't know, there's a lot on children. There's so much that you can teach them, but screens are big and you all know it. And I, we do just pray for your kids' um, protection, their minds, when they um, have to have one of those in their hands. Yeah, that's good. Nate and Allison, anything you want to add? I know you see kind of the list of questions there. Anything that sticks out to you you want to address? Oh. Um, I thought this said how to discipline. It actually says how to disciple. But uh, so you prepared notes on. I pre- prepared <laughs> notes on discipline. I was, I was born in Texas. Uh, lived in Texas, so I definitely uh, received many whoopings uh, <laughs> as a young boy. You know, in our family, uh, my wife and I, you know, we kind of try to hold something we call the three D's of discipline. If our child's being dishonest. Uh, disrespectful or disobedient, the three Ds. Dishonest, disrespectful, and disobedience. And, um, and the consequence uh, would vary. Now we have a 17-year-old, and, you know, 17, 14, 12, and 9 kind of varies the discipline. But we did, you know, we, I created a little, I uh, got one of those nice wooden spoons uh, from the kitchen drawer. We called it uh, Mr. Boom Boom. And uh, we put a little... <laughs> We put a little Sharpie sad face on him, and uh, that's what we would do. Sometimes it just took me putting Mr. Boom Boom, you know, on the table uh, to all of a sudden get some things. So obviously, my daughter, 17-year-old, is not receiving Mr. Boom Boom anymore, but so it does change. But I, I do think that um, discipline is a big deal. I, I think that our children uh, need to be disciplined. I'm not the best at it. I wasn't the best at it. We try to be consistent with it. Um, we tried to be quick. I mean, we tried to, the moment of the disobedience or disrespect or dishonesty, we'd have an immediate consequence, you know. Um, and so we tried to do the best we can. And those are things that have uh, changed from, you know, taking phones away, and we've tried to be creative that way. But I think our biggest thing was consistency. And if we said, like, no, uh, it was just the one, you know, it was first time, you know, obey right away. Um, with a grin above your chin, you know, so like if those things didn't happen, there would be a consequence right away, and we didn't try to, we didn't, you know, let them get away with stuff, I don't think. I don't know if you want to speak in. I was good on that. I was going to talk about, um, one of the questions was, what does an evangelizing family look like? And this has looked different for our family each year even, and I think an evangelizing family starts with being planted in the church, and this is where the kids and the families are planted and poured into to then go out. Um, and we have been in ministry our whole marriage and all of the time we've had kids, and that's looked like for our family being planted and serving and being together in the body, and our kids from day one have been at church, and Sunday mornings they're at church, they're not at sports, and that's a hard decision to make week after week. As we know, we have four kids, they're into all the sports, they're into all the things, but Sunday morning we're at church. And we're also facing, we have teenagers, Wednesday nights. There's a lot of things that go on Wednesday nights. And Wednesday nights, they're going to be at youth group. And so if they're not at youth group, they're going to be at home. But I think it takes the parents choosing that and teaching them that there's a priority there to be filled up and then go out. Um, With our four kids, I was talking to Lynn about this. And each year, we've prayed about what the Lord has for our kids for schooling. And so they've been in private school since kindergarten, preschool. And just this year, we have a son who's going into ninth, or he's in ninth grade, and he asked to go to the public school, and we were like, we'll pray about it, bud, we'll see. And so we prayed all summer, and the Lord told us to let him go, and our senior is still at the private school. And what that looked like was us really championing him and encouraging him to go out and be 
the Lord's hands and feet. And so our family is looking different on how we serve the community and how we evangelize now. It's me taking granola bars to the football team. It's me having these boys over and our family and our home is now a ministry for the football teams. And our family is all in it together. My nine-year-old is serving waters and my nine-year-old is cutting the oranges because as a family, we've committed to serve the Lord by serving these football players in this public high school. So I think it looks different what it looks like to be evangelizing and serving the Lord and preaching the gospel, and it can be so simple for you to teach your kids what that means and to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That's great. No, that's very good. Um, one thing we'll speak to real quickly, because I know we have two more topics to get to. Um, kind of three or four questions could kind of come under this one topic of how do you disciple your kids to know Jesus? So everything we've talked about is helping them become learners of Jesus. That's all a disciple is. But I do think kids need structure. Imagine, can you believe I would say that, the guy that's like... Saps reports. Saps reports. Kids, come on. I need your saps at 9 a.m. What is the deal here? No. Here's two things that we do to provide structure. Morning devotions and dinner time. Those two things. Um, and we have found that those two things being rhythms for us have provided a lot of opportunity for discipleship to be taught and caught. And CC does, I, I think, a, a fantastic job of Deuteronomy. You know, everywhere you go, at the door, here, you're always telling your kids about Jesus. The music that's on, it's about Jesus. When we're over here, it's about you. And then I'm kind of the guy, okay, sit down. Here's an alliterated lesson. You know, like, that's what I'll do. But so, again, collaboratively, it works because CC's very good with the organic. And I'm maybe good at the strategic. And so, but the strategy is very simple. Before we start our day, we started with Jesus, and there, there's a church that does this video every single, <laughs> that's what we use. I'm being honest with you. We use that video, and then we just EQ it. Leo, what did you hear? Our six-year-old. I heard Jesus is coming back. Great job, Leo. Lily, Lucy, and then, and then, you know, that kind of thing. But then dinner time. And dinner time, there's not some big debrief, and there's no SAPS report or anything, but <laughs> how was your day, you know? And it's like, but statistically, they will tell you those families that value dinner time are stable families. They're not running to and fro, and it's all this and that, but there's some consistency, consistency, consistency. It's the tortoise that wins, not the hare on fire. And so I think um, that organic and strategic, I feel like, I don't know if there's anything you want to say about that, but that's kind of our blend, and it's like what you're exampling with the football team and discipline and all that, but yeah. Anything you would add? or Yeah, um, just about like dinner time, um, we try to make that a time that they look forward to. I wondered just recently, like, oh, I wonder if it matters as much to my kids as it does to me to sit down together. And so I had one of my kids, one of my older kids, actually say, you know, I don't think we had dinner um, together since last week. When are we doing that again? And so I was like, oh, okay, well, that matters. And so um, I was really surprised. Um, I was actually a couple weeks ago. And so something that we do special at dinners, we set the whole mood. Well, the kids love the, the dimmer on the lights and the, the candles, and we make it like a special thing where we're all setting the mood, enjoying it together, and making it a beautiful thing. And so they look forward to it. And so I was like, wow, that's, that's really neat how the Lord did that. And I didn't, I was just trying to make it special, I guess, and they liked it. But um, yeah. Okay, good. Well, we'll move to our next topic. And this is a, a very hot cultural topic right now. It's the topic of transgender or the LGBTQ. And our uh, video content is from Pastor Lance Ralston. The bottom line problem with Site B is that it normalizes sin. Now, I need to be careful with how I state this because we need to make a distinction between temptation and sin. But, and this is important as we'll develop later, there is a relationship between temptation and sin. Temptation can lead to sin because some desires are disordered. They aren't good and ought to be turned from before they lead to sin. Side B says that same-sex attraction is not wrong. It just is. In fact, Side B proposes that calling oneself a gay Christian is perfectly legitimate. All that's forbidden is acting on that attraction. Well, all we have to do to see the error in that is to apply it to some other desire. 
Would we say that the child attracted adult can identify as a pedophile Christian, as long as they don't act out? Shall the person attracted to, well, let's say gossip, identify as a gossip Christian, you know, as long as they resist that urge? The use of any adjective to modify our identity as a disciple of Jesus is inappropriate. How absurd is it to identify as a heterosexual or straight Christian? <laughs> we are not white Christians, Hispanic Christians, black Christians, Asian Christians, nor are we Mexican, Peruvian, or Guamian Christians. We are Christians, period. Our identity is in Christ, as Paul's letter to the Ephesian church makes abundantly clear. It is that identity that, through the process of sanctification, rewrites the identity the fall bequeathed us collectively and individually. So, so one of the questions is how to biblically address the transgender issue or the transgender person. And I think my response would be, well, you address the individual with love with respect and with truth. You, you, you respond with truth and love. It, it kind of reminds me of when the rich young ruler came to Jesus. He was very wealthy, and Jesus knew that that was the issue in his life. And he said, so sell everything you have because that's what's got your heart. Come follow me. Well, he went away sad. He wasn't willing to leave it. Jesus let him go. But he spoke to him lovingly and truthfully. Now the woman caught in adultery, she also there at his feet, Jesus addresses her, he says some things to those who are condemning her, he's very loving, he's very caring, and he says, where is your, those who condemn you, I don't see any, he goes, neither do I, but go and sin no more, and that's what she did. So you, there's two different responses, but I think the approach by Jesus was the same, love, respect, and truth. And in this whole transgender thing, there is a truth that God created male and female. He didn't create transgender. And you speak to those people lovingly, respectfully, but truthfully. And then they have to choose how to respond. And I think, uh, at least for myself, that would be my response to addressing a transgender individual. It's pretty much the same. I can't say that I've come full face with it, um, but I, I do know that, you know, we have to believe the Bible as our standard and our truth. That is our level of truth, and that a male and female, he's created them. That's how it is. When you were in your mother's womb, he was working on you. He makes no mistakes. But I would have to say for me, as I navigate through this and um, have come across with it in some of the, um, some of my bumping up next to people outside the church, that I need to be compassionate because I don't know their story. And, and they do have a story. And we live in a sinful, fallen world. And there's a lot of brokenness. So it's been a coping mechanism for the that particular person be compassionate but yet maintain the biblical standard of gender um, and for me I have to be very careful and I wrote this down to be uh, to be very careful with my facial I am very expressive um, with my tone and with my language um, just to be compassionate and when I'm with um, I mean, yeah, when I'm with someone of that particular persuasion, to just to be compassionate and see if the Lord gives me an opening. Yeah, Paul says in Ephesians 4, With the Lord's authority I say this, Live no longer as the Gentiles, for they're hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander from the life God gives because they've closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that is not what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your formal life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Um, gender, homosexuality, 
heterosexuality outside of a committed relationship and marriage. These are not new things. When Paul is writing letters to the Christians in Ephesus, Rome was amazingly wicked. For those of us that live in the 21st century of America, for so long, cultural values and biblical values somewhat blurred. So we, ah, oh, we can hang out here. And I think we must realize we are not of this world. This is not our home. This is a tent. Our home is in a place not built with hands. And so one man with one woman becoming one flesh for one lifetime is the equation. If you'll say it like that, you answer everything. One man, one woman becoming one flesh for one lifetime. That answers the question. But how? I came across this, I think it's called an acrostic, is that what you say? LGBTQ? How do we communicate? Lavish love. Give grace. Bless big. Tell the truth. And quietly listen. But here's the deal. This is all of us. Every single one of us are sinners separated by God. There's no, the, the plane is the same. And you hurt someone when you affirm, it's okay to gossip. It's okay to steal. It's okay to commit heterosexual or homosexual. No, that's what put Jesus on the cross. And then that's what, that's what will bind us. The best thing you can do is communicate truth in a loving way. And friendship evangelism is the long road. I'll never forget when Cece and I were dating, we were on a canoe trip down Blackwater River. Cece is an art student. She has a degree in graphic design. And so art, you know, it has a certain attraction to people, you know, a lot of different wonderful people in the art department. And um, we were going down on this canoe, and this individual that was um, big shoulders, but, you know, dressed in a female way, we're going down the river, and the individual says, hello, Cecilia. And I was like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that voice. And what was the individual's name? Uh, Lauren was his name. And um, I said, do you know Lauren? Oh, yeah, in my art, you know. But here's what I loved about Cece. Cece had only known Jesus for a couple of years at that point. You heard about her story. And I love, oh, yeah, that's Lauren. We talked. Like, that's, you need to be in the world, but not of the world. Lauren felt comfortable saying, hello, Cece, as we were on a church trip, canoe trip. Does that make sense? Like, being in the world, but not of the world, but not losing your standard, not compromising. And... Um, that's not the greatest sin in a person's life. Do you understand that? It's, it's the rejection of Jesus. That, that, it's the, it, that's the sin of going against the Holy Spirit's conviction. That, that's, that is the sin. And so I think it is hard, as my mom, mom shared, sometimes you go, man, that's just so unnatural. So it can take you, put you on your heels. Yes, like that's what it says in Ephesians. Their, their minds are darkened. So I do think we have to make sure we EQ our IQ. Does that make sense? With love and grace, bless big, you know, quietly listen. Because um, you're there to win a soul, not win an argument. And um, that takes time and patience. And uh, that's what I would say about that. Anything you guys would say? You come from California, so everyone here thinks like, what do they got to say? You know, what is going on there? You know, <laughs> land of the fruits, flakes, and nuts, you know, California. Thank you. I can Thank say you, that. Neil. I was a California resident. I can say that. Thank yeah, you, yeah. Neil. Appreciate that. I'm still trying to think about what SAP stands for. Um, so I think, uh, you know, one of the things that's kind of helped guided my uh, mentality is, is a little thing I thought about. Um, Jesus, I believe, drew circles, but he also drew lines. We think about the life of Jesus. He drew big circles. He invited a lot of people into his space. If you think about that, like he invited a lot of people into his space, or he went into a lot of other people's spaces. Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I'm going to go over to your house today. He drew big circles, and uh, and I think I need to draw bigger circles. You know, I need to be more friendly to to people that are not like me. I, I want to get into people's spaces that maybe I'm not that comfortable with. But so Jesus drew circles, but he also drew lines. Yeah. Uh, there's right. And wrong. There's truth and error. As uh, Pastor John mentioned, he goes to the woman caught in adultery. Um, listen, go and sin no more. I'm drawing a line in the sand. Your lifestyle before was uh, incorrect, was wicked, so don't, do, don't live like that anymore. 
I'm drawing a line in the sand. And uh, I, I actually preached that a little bit ago in a church service, and I had a few people stand up and leave uh, because that's not the kind of message they want. They want Jesus, big circle Jesus, big circle Jesus, which is true, absolutely true. I mean, he's at dinner with prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors. You're like, how is he doing that? His, 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 um, uh, his um, uh, showing up in that space didn't approve that space, you know, because uh, he drew lines. And so that's what I've been trying to think about. How can I uh, make sure my circles are big but my lines are drawn with Sharpie and, um, as, as, a, as a father, as a leader? I don't know. Yeah, I think, as Neil said, California, I was like, is this even relevant here in Florida? Um, but, yeah, Nate was preaching through Romans, and we did have a few families stand up and leave, and one of those families was our best friends. And so we've walked this. Um, it's super tender for me. I think Nate's just a man, and so it's different. But as Neil said, um, we evangelize for the long haul. And so we have learned what it means to listen quietly and continue to hold God's word and say, this is not an offense on me. This is God's word, and this is what we're holding to. And so that's also what our kids have had to walk because they're all best friends, and they've chosen to leave the church over this issue. But this is not an offense of the Wagner family or Anthem Chapel. This is God's word. And so I think, though, it's so important to still love people well when we think, see things differently, and especially in our culture as things, these lines are going to be drawn more and more. It's so important how we as believers draw those lines with love and with truth of God's word, but also listening quietly. And I see so many believers that are... Um, they're losing unity over these issues, and I think it's just the enemy winning because um, we're just being divided, and that's going to happen more and more, but I think it's so important how we walk out these issues well, holding God's truth um, higher and higher. It's hard, but it's so good, um, but yeah, we walk it in California very often. Let, let me just read one more question, probably have time, from Culture that says, um, what's appropriate media content for wow. Christians in today's world? Do you want, not want me to read that? Uh, actually, it is a touchy subject between us, because I like, I like to watch old westerns where they kill people, and, and I, watch, I watch the gladiator, you know. Okay, it's yeah. kind of, okay. <laughs> but 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 here's the thing: Lynn will not watch that stuff because it bothers her. So I would never watch anything like that if she's there. And I don't watch anything with you know sexual stuff and inappropriate things like that. And I and I think the 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 we, we watch a lot of Hallmark shows, you know, stuff. Like that. <laughs> but. Appropriate media content, I think you, if you can go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, you know, whatsoever things are, are true and just and lovely, of good report, uh, think upon these things, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I think it's very important, especially in today's access to so many things. Uh, we made a, a, a commitment to one another a long time ago. We don't go to R-rated movies. We, we, we don't fill our minds with that kind of stuff. And, and we try to have that kind of mindset of whatsoever things are just, lovely, good report. Let those kind of things seep into your mind. And, and I think Lynn is just a lot more impacted by stuff than I am. I, I don't know. I think men compartmentalize a little better. Uh, but well, you can't lose what you see. I think it still goes in your mind. So that's what I tell him. <laughs> well, next okay, question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pastor Nate, Nate did you had something else something before we to look at the last topic? Okay, okay. All right. last topic. Yeah. So our, our final topic is politics. And the video content is a couple of different guys speaking, but uh, featuring uh, pastor and teacher Chuck Smith, the founder of Calvary Chapel Churches. So here it is. Well, would both of you guys kind of address this then, looking at, at the situation of our nation, you know, the politics and elections coming up in the fall, you know, you have James Dobson giving out the voter guide, and sometimes I think we wonder how, 
how much do we involve ourselves in this? I think you know, in our in our hearts, we know that we're not ultimately called to magisterial reform. We're we're called to spread the kingdom, and yet we're American citizens. We're called to be good citizens. Where's the balance in the political world? How involved do we get, uh, or, or or not get, or? I don't trust politicians. <laughs> I think that they will use you and then dispose of you once they have used you. And I think that they are masters at that. And uh, I've got burned a couple of times in uh, supporting a particular candidate that uh, did represent themselves quite well, uh, you know, and uh, I was convinced that they really had uh, Christian values and so forth, but then when they once got into office, uh, suddenly I didn't see uh, a promoting of the Christian values that they were espousing, uh, but they just seemed to fall into the same old pattern of just a politician. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I think that if we don't have some kind of uh, involvement, in other words, I do believe that uh, we should try to encourage uh, good people to run for office and uh, I, and to support them. And I do think that uh, if we just bury our heads and say, well, I don't want anything to do with politics or with voting or whatever, then how can you uh, complain when you get uh, poor uh, government, you know? And I spent a few years where I actually traveled with and spoke with Mike Huckabee, Newt Gingrich, and a few others. And uh, it really kind of caught a little caught up in their whole thing because I felt, you know, we're to be salt and light and we're to do all that we possibly can. But the more I got around the whole element, uh, to tell you the truth, the more disillusioned I got because I felt like uh, uh, I want to vote for people that are righteous I, and that want to uh, truly have conservative values. And, uh, uh, and but yet in the realization of things, I... I guess I just kind of lost sense of that anything is going to happen there. God, the work he's going to do, he doesn't need government to do it at all. And, uh, and I do believe at the same time, we are to vote. We, like Chuck says, I don't have a right to complain if I don't vote. Then I have the right uh, to complain. <laughs> I can tell you what I think of you, but if I don't at least try to stop you. Uh, uh, so I, I think that we are to be salt and light and abide uh, you know, uh, while we can. But, uh, and so to have people do that, but also realize that in terms of people coming to Christ, the body of Christ growing and doing the things that we're really about, that the government is not going to ever help us with that. And uh, we need to keep that balance, I think. So, so let me just say this. Uh, I think we have an obligation as believers to vote for the candidate that most represents Christian values that we hold. And I want to just say this too. Jesus is never going to run for office. <laughs> so there's never going to be a perfect candidate and there never has been. But you have to vote for, if, if you believe in the freedom of our country and want to try and maintain biblical values, then I think you have a, have a, a debt to vote for the person that most represents the Christian values, the biblical values that you hold. To not vote is to give a vote to a candidate that perhaps who doesn't support those values. So I think it's important for a believer to vote. You're never going to have a perfect candidate that's running for office. And I, I watched a message recently that said these are biblical values. These are not political values. And he said life gender, borders. God was always in the borders with Israel. Uh, Israel itself is a big issue with God. 
judges that serve our communities, religious freedom, and family. Those are things that are biblical issues long before they tried to make them for you and I into political issues. And I think we have to vote and voice our opinions as believers are as like Don McClure said, you don't have any right to complain. And we need to stand up and vote for those things that represent our Christian values. If believers don't vote, well, you get what you deserve. So I know we got to close fairly soon. We've got ice cream sandwiches and children that are waiting for us. So and they both melt. Yeah, and they both melt. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Nate and Allison, you're coming from a different political context than maybe we are in Florida. Um, elections, voting, governance—is that a deal in California? Does it matter? Or like, do you guys have anything to say? Or well, so our vote wearing, does kind of wearing our, red, white, and blue a little bit. Our, our vote does not count. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I mean, we actually did a registration voter, voter registration Sunday, last Sunday, and I just uh, stood up stood up before the congregation and I said, hey, we're called to occupy, just as we just heard, Pastor John, occupy all streets, occupy the land, and uh, be salt to preserve a decaying culture, be light that shines bright in a dark world, and uh, to vote biblically. And as Pastor John mentioned, Jesus is not on the ballot um, but uh, we should, as much as possible, vote for the candidate or the platform that mostly aligns with our biblical values. And so I was able to do that on a Sunday morning, and no one walked out on that uh, issue. And actually, we had on, on the back table some voter registration forms, and I think people were blessed by it. Uh, but we know we, we did not want to do um, voter uh, guides, to be honest. We didn't want to do voter guides. We didn't want to, uh, you know, some people ask, well, who should be our local people? Do we know any of the local people that are running? So we maybe had some information there, but we're trying to just educate and encourage our people. So it was, I was, I was a little nervous, to be honest. I was a little bit nervous because, as my wife mentioned, we have had people just straight up stand up and leave, which is not that fun, to be honest. You know, it's pretty, it's hard, you know, so, uh, but yeah. That's good. Let me just share two thoughts quickly. One's from Jeremiah 29. Um, God is speaking through Jeremiah to a people group that are in exile, meaning they're in a land that is not the promised land. And um, here's what he says. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens. Eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Find spouses for them so that they may have grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away, and this is what I want to read to you, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you. They're in exile. Where I sent you, pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. And there's this dynamic of, oh, it's all going to burn. We're just going to heaven. You know, forget. No, 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 no. Occupy where you are. Have six children. You know, like, uh, like impact the kingdom. You know, like bring light. You know, you're called to be salt and light, meaning where it's dark, make it brighter, where it's bitter, make it better. That, that's what you're to do as a Christian. Make it brighter, make it better. And you are to seek the welfare of anything that's before you. And here's the thing that I think is so interesting. God is sovereign. He sent you to where you are. You are to steward it well. And I think that as family, yeah. And so the last thing I would say about that is this. Family, church, and government are the three institutions ordained by God. Family, church, and government. Steward them well, but also in that order. Yeah. Oh, it's not on. God uses imperfect leaders, yeah. Exactly. Even... <laughs> You're not voting for a Valentine. God uses imperfect leaders all through the Old Testament. We, the ladies that all of us are doing the recap Bible, those, every, most of those guys were bad. Most of those leaders were bad. Some were good, but God used them all. God is faithful. He's going to fulfill his purpose for the world, global. We need to be salt and light. He wants to use us in the midst of our culture, like Neil is saying. But just coming through the Old Testament, you see the faithfulness of God with imperfect man, imperfect people. Yeah, and I, I always have this little cliche. God will always do his part, 
but you have to do your part. Amen. They won't do your part. Yeah. Yeah, and give them your vote, not your heart. You know, your heart should belong to Jesus. Um, but you've got to, you got to steward what's before you. Um, yeah. And so I, I don't know. I feel like that's good. We should eat ice cream now. You think? Yeah. Yeah. Can you yeah. just tell us what SAPS means by the, at the end SAPS. of this? Yeah, we will have an email that goes out to all those that are interested about SAPS. Don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. A sappy life is a happy life. Trust me on that one. 